In our daily lives, we have functions and we also have subroutines. For example, I have a routine for washing the car, making a cup of coffee, or going shopping. So let's take a look at one of these verbs. For example, shopping. Shopping is a verb, it's an action. Now, when I say to myself, I'm going shopping, well, shopping is a verb, it's an action, but I know that behind a verb, there's lots of instructions. For example, what are you shopping for? What items are you getting and how are you getting them? And what process in which you get them? So I have a subroutine or function. You can call a function a subroutine or a subroutine a function. It's just a routine of instructions to be run. Now, our programming languages don't have that. Our minds can instantaneously know what we're going to do, but you need to tell the computer what set of instructions you need to run to complete the actions of that verb. For example, shopping. Shopping requires a list of instructions, like a shopping list. So how do we define one of these subroutines or functions? Well, typically in most programming languages, they use the function keyword and then they want the name of the function, the verb. And it's best to make it a verb, such as shopping is a verb. Then we have the parentheses, which we'll come back to in just a second, and then we have the braces. Now the braces is the shopping list. It's called an execution context, just like when I walk into my local grocery store, for example, I am now going to execute my commands. I'm gonna start walking around and start putting things in the trolley. It's an execution context to complete the verb. So now that we've discovered what we need to do, which is write a list of instructions to the compiler or interpreter or a combination of the two, doesn't matter. And what we want to do is we want to tell it what to do. Bang, 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 to complete the entire experience. So for example, we have shopping and we have the execution context. And what we want to do is go around the hours. We want to fetch different items, whatever it may be, bread, vegetables, whatever it may be. Now, when you're finished, what happens? Well, you go to the checkout, and when you go to the checkout, you get a receipt. You get some information back of all the items that you purchased. Now, with your functions, you have return statements, and typically they're found at the end of the execution context. And that's because when the JIT compiler, for example, is running through the instructions, when it hits a return statement, and it executes that statement, it stops all the execution. It literally stops running any more instructions. It's basically just gonna return that piece of information. So for example, I could return a string with all of the items that I have purchased. I could also return an object, an array, or any other type of data that I'd like. But what it is, is it's a summation of the entire execution. What do we want to get out of this function once it's finished executing. Now, if you don't have a return statement, you have what is a procedure or a void function. What that means is it's not returning anything. It's simply running these instructions and it doesn't give anything back to the, the programmer once it's finished. It just does its list of instructions and that's it. It doesn't give you any information back. And one good example is an addition function. For example, I can have the add subroutine and it takes, for example, A and B and it adds A and B together and it returns the number. So five plus five, return 10. So what this will now do is when I invoke it and the way you invoke it is you call it by its name, just like I invoke you by your name, I get you to respond and communicate with me when I call your name, we well, are calling this subroutine, this function's name like saying it in your mind, and it starts executing the commands and it returns me the value 10. And I can take that value 10 and use it somewhere else in my program. Now, this isn't really useful. This function that I have here, this add function, is not that useful because every time I invoke it, I know I'm gonna get the same answer, 10. So I might as well just create a variable that has the value 10 and use that variable throughout my program. So this is a waste of time. So what I need to do is I need to make my verb adaptable. Just like if I was to go shopping, for example. If I'm to go shopping, I may adapt the process. I may say I want to go and buy some additional goods. 
or I may want to buy certain types of goods. So let's go back to the shopping example. What I need to do now is pass in arguments, arguments of values and parameters of variables that are defined when the function or subroutine is created. Think of the parameters as empty boxes and the arguments are the values that go in to the empty boxes. And for example, I can have the parameter buy groceries or buy clothes. So now I have two parameters, two empty boxes, and we need to give these values. For example, I could say true to buying groceries and false to buying clothes. And my subroutine now executes. And what happens is I start executing and it says, do you want to buy groceries? Yes or no. So we have an if statement here. We have a conditional execution context. If we want to buy groceries, then we're going to buy these items. Then we move on and we carry on following down. If I want to buy clothes, well, that's actually false. And we're getting that value from the argument passed in. We don't want to buy clothes now. So we skip over that completely. So we've only bought groceries and no clothes. So now what I have is a return statement that returns all of the items that I have purchased. That's nice and easy. But I can invoke the function again. Again, we invoke the function and again we have the parentheses here and in the parentheses we have the arguments and I'm going to say true to both, buy groceries and buy clothes. And now I'm going to take my function, they both have true and notice how we get a different return where we have now, we buy all groceries and we buy all clothes. And now we get a return statement for all of these items that we purchased. And likewise, I could say, don't buy groceries, just buy clothes. So we have a subroutine, we have a list of instructions that we can execute and we can adapt this instruction, just like verbs adapt. If I say I'm going shopping, well, how are you going shopping? Are you going shopping for clothes or food or both? So now we can adapt our verb to suit the situation when we need it. And it's just one subroutine. It's one list of instructions that we've written here, but we can have different outputs depending on how we've invoked that subroutine or that function. And that is exactly how it works. Now, there's been a lot of confusion with me when it comes to parameters and arguments. And I kind of was bugged about it and I realized, keep it simple. Arguments are the values you're passing in and parameters are essentially empty boxes. And these empty boxes are created, they're given the values, and then when the function has finished executing, these empty, these boxes are now destroyed. They're completely destroyed and they're no longer in memory. Now the reason why these names were interchangeable is because you can actually call an argument an actual argument or actual parameter. And you can call a parameter a formal parameter or formal argument. So you can see how the word argument and parameter are swapped around. But please don't complicate it. So what they decided to do was just get rid of all that. Don't make it interchangeable. Arguments are the values you're passing in to adapt the way the verb works to change the execution, if you will. And parameters are the empty boxes that receive them. It's a place for storing those values only for a temporary amount of time. And then those boxes are destroyed out of memory because we don't want them anymore. Once we've finished executing, we don't want that data anymore. So it's cleared out of memory and it's free for our application to take it up with something else. One last thing, why do we say parameters instead of variables and arguments instead of values because technically an argument is a value that wouldn't be incorrect and also parameters are variables that again is not incorrect but why do we give them special names well for example I don't need to tell you the context I can just tell you parameter an argument and you would know what I'm talking about for example pass it some arguments now you know immediately that that is a function we're talking about. I didn't have to say the word function. I didn't have to define the context. I just said arguments and you knew immediately that means we're invoking a function and arguments are values 
passed to a function. And I didn't need to say add an extra parameter and I didn't need to say function in that sentence. I didn't need to say the context. You knew that when I said parameter, that meant a special variable that's declared when the function is invoked and it's given a value, an argument. So that's why we don't say parameters are variables and also we don't say that arguments are values. We just say arguments and parameters. So it puts it in context, it's very specific and you know what I'm talking about when I say it.